O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. It is a joy to be here together in this place on this beautiful day uh, as we celebrate uh, really lots of new beginnings, the beginning of football season for NFL fans. Um, we were hoping for the beginning of fall, but I guess 90 degrees today really doesn't uh, make that happen. Uh, but we've been talking about uh, joy last week. Pastor Chris started that, and we're going to continue talking about how to cultivate joy in your life today uh, as we gather together. So as we come around the one who is our joy, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we are going to join in our opening hymn, which is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Uh, so please join me in singing our opening hymn. rise and call in the name of the Lord who is worthy to receive our worship and praise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. 
Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Jacob, to all generations. Praise be. As penitent people, we ask God for his grace and mercy. Let us now confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. Gracious God, in heartfelt repentance, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We are sin-stained people by nature. Each day we have sinned and done things we ought not to have done and have not done that which we are to have been doing as your servants. We have not seen people in the loving way that you see them. We have not always been ready to care and quick to help. We do indeed deserve your punishment in this life and for eternity. Trusting in your mercy, we come to you for forgiveness. Our trust is in the merits of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Grant us forgiveness from all our sins. And by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within our hearts and lives, lead us into the ways that reflect your goodness and love. God is loving and merciful. He sees us with his loving eyes and graciously hears our supplication. By the command of the Lord and as his called and ordained servant, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, 
Grant that we may think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the lesson. The first reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle is from 1 John, chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed which is found at the bottom of page 8 in your service folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the boys and girls to tune in up here. It's great to have you all here. Last night we had like 40 kids here with our kindergarten through second grade singing, so it was fun to have all of them up here as well. We're talking about joy today. Why should we be joyful? More importantly, we know why we should be joyful, but what does it mean? How do we stay joyful? How does God call us to be joyful? Do you think Jesus was joyful when he was here? Do you think Jesus was joyful? Yeah, I think Jesus was joyful when he was here. He seemed to love what he did. It had to be a lot of fun to go around and heal the sick and to teach people who really wanted to learn and to see people uh, discover God's love and watch them get baptized by his cousin John. There were lots of reasons that Jesus had to be joyful in the world. But I would tell you that I think he was joyful primarily because of his perspective on life, the way that he lived his life and who he was worried about. 
So who did Jesus worry about? Who did he talk to? Who was he concerned about the most, do you think? He was concerned about his Father in heaven, right? He was always talking about his Father and praying to his Father and pointing people to his Father. And when he'd heal someone, he'd say, don't give me any credit, give credit to the Father. And after the Father, was Jesus more worried about himself or other people? Jesus was always worried about other people, wasn't he? Jesus was always thinking about what other people need. Did they need to be taught? Did they need to hear that Jesus, that God loved them? Did they need to be healed? What did we need? Why, we needed someone to take care of our sin, right? And, and the sadness that was in God's heart because of what we had done. And so because he was worried about us, he went to the cross, and he bled and died there that we might be made right with his father because he was more concerned about his father and you and your relationship to the father than he was about even his own life. Last thing Jesus was worried about was himself. It's interesting that we usually get that completely backwards. We usually worry about ourselves first. What do I need? What do I want? What do I desire? We worry about us. And then we worry about other people. Well, who'll do that with me? Or what do they think about me? Or what can I do for them to make everybody happy, right? Then we worry about everybody. And, and last of all, we think about God. Last of all, we think about what would make God happy. Usually we fight the things that would make God happy. Right? I don't want to go to church this morning. I'm really tired. We had a late night. Michigan played till like 11 o'clock. We, we think about God last. But Jesus did it the other way. So when you think about joy, one of the things someone said about joy, if you remember it this way, joy is spelled J-O-Y. And for our own lives, we worry about Jesus first. We worry about others, oh, second. And lastly, you worry about yourself. And if you'll love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, as Jesus said, if you'll focus on him, <clears throat> he will show you all the wonderful things that he's doing. And you'll remember how much he loves you and what he's done for you. And then if you take care of the needs of others, you'll find that life is really fun that people have needs, but they're really, they really like it when other people help them. When you come along in the playground with someone who needs a friend, or you share your lunch with somebody who forgot theirs, and you take care of other people, you feel really good because you know that God is using you. And the last person you worry about is why yourself. If you'll remember to worry about Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, J-O-Y, you will have much more joy in your life. Will you pray with me? I'm going to say part of a prayer. Let's all say it up to God. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, help me live, help me live with the joy you give, with the joy you give. Let me put you first, let me put you first, others second, others second, and myself last, so that your joy would be full that your joy would be full. In Jesus' name, amen. We join in our message hymn.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always <laughs> may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Joy. Pastor Chris kicked off our conversation about jumping for joy here uh, this last week and this week. And I was reminded as I was listening to him talk last week of one of the first sermons I ever heard on joy. I never left a church feeling more miserable than the day I went and heard this preacher talk about joy. I was, we were going to church with family in another denomination um, for a big family event, and that was his topic. So let me just ask you, because I've always said this, and, and people sort of laugh, but I, I really kind of mean it. You don't have to be Lutheran to go to heaven but it helps, right? That's sort of my statement. So if I asked you, why should you be joyful? If you were trying to put together a talk, a message on joy, what would be some reasons to be joyful as Christians? What do you think? Because of Jesus, what about Jesus? He did it all. He saved us. How did he do that? He died on the cross for our sins. And what do we have because Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Eternal life. Eternal life. Woo! Forgiveness and eternal. Those are reasons to be joyful, right? Jesus came. He came for us even though we didn't deserve it. He took all of our sins with him in Jerusalem to the cross and there bled and died and left them all there so that when he broke open the tomb that we would have eternal life. That's a pretty exciting message, right? That's why people come at Easter more than Good Friday, right? Because they love to hear that great news that Jesus is risen and we have life. So this was the message from the Psalms. 20 times in the Psalms, I think it's actually 22 times in the Psalms, God commands his people to be joyful. And if you are not filled with joy as a follower of God, you are a disobedient and rebellious child. And you need to repent. <laughs> what? <laughs> For 40 minutes, he hammered us with how miserable we were because we weren't more joyful. Can I tell you it was counterproductive? <laughs> Joy can't be commanded. Joy cannot be ordered. If it could, our children would be really joyful people because we've told them over and over again how easy they have it, right? Right? I mean, back in our day, we didn't have all this technology. You had to go to the library and learn some Dewey Decimal System. There's no Google search. What are you talking about? And you know they're not any more joyful for hearing about how miserable our young lives were. Or any more appreciative, really, of the things that they have. That's just not how joy works. Joy can't be commanded. Joy has to be cultivated. Joy has to be planted and watered and tended and cared for in our lives. It's not something that we are simply zapped with, but rather something that we as followers of Jesus are called to cultivate, to tend, and to display the blossoming joy in our lives to the world because that's what they're really looking for. And sadly, the world has mistaken happiness for joy. Happiness is that moment, that moment when the Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup, that moment when you remember that the Bears once long ago, but not so long ago as my team, won a Super Bowl, right? In those moments, you are happy, you are excited. Joy, by definition, is an abiding sense of well-being an abiding sense of well-being. Joy is when throughout your day, you just have this sense that everything's okay, that everything is moving forward, that everything is working according to the plan, that everything ultimately is good. Not that bad things don't come and go and our happiness can go up and down, but our joy is sort of this underlying contentment and we mistake it for happiness. 
The other part of joy is that joy comes either by success, winning the championship, or this is another big day for us, because joy also comes at the prospect of possessing that which we desire. Right? And so on the opening day of the NFL, for most teams, we all have hope because we're all undefeated, right? And the prospect of possessing that which we desire gives us joy on this day. That definition is important as we look at cultivating joy in our lives, this abiding sense of well-being. Jesus tells us that he came that we might have joy And have it to the full. This is in the midst of the vine and the branches conversation. And he tells us that first of all, in order to truly cultivate joy in our lives, that we need to stay connected to him. That he is the vine and we are the branches. He is the thing connected to the soil, to the Father, to heaven. And through him, we gain all of the spiritual nurture and nourishment that we need. And if we stay connected in him, that we will have joy. And his joy, his goal is to give us a life filled with joy. Are you doing the things that keep you connected to Jesus? Or are they at the end of your daily to-do list and the ones that don't usually get checked off? Are you in his word? Are you figuring out how to go deeper in prayer? Are you engaged in community with others in Bible study? Are you doing the things that connect you to Jesus and strengthen that connection? Because those activities actually cultivate joy in our lives. If you haven't noticed, there's some crazy stuff going on in our world today. And Satan loves to use the crazy stuff going on in our world to steal your joy. That isn't to say to make you unhappy, Because happiness and joy are different things. But it steals your sense of contentment, your sense that everything is well with the world. You notice that God often in Scripture puts joy and peace together. Because joy and peace are the two sides of shalom. Shalom in Hebrew is a sense of well-being, that things are good and that all will be well. Things are good, and they will continue to be good. Shalom is this abiding sense that all is well with the world. And when you look at our world today, you go, everything is not well. And if my hope is in my local, state, or federal government to fix all of the problems that are in the world, we're going to be really disappointed, regardless of who's filling those offices. Because they can't keep the next problem from coming. And more often than not, they don't help this problem. They make it worse. Our sense of all is well with the world dissipates when we put that on people. When you expect your spouse to make you happy. If you thought getting married meant that you finally met the person that was going to meet all of your deepest needs, you met the wrong person. The person who was designed to meet all of your deepest needs is the one up here. Is Jesus to whom you are supposed to be connected and this person is supposed to enhance and show you that love and grace and kindness and share your joy. But they aren't the source of your joy. We displace where our joy is supposed to come from all the time. We put it on our boss, we put it on our coworkers, we put it on the government, we put it on our financial well-being, we put it on all kinds of things. And all of those are fleeting. All of those will vanish. All of those can be stolen. All of those can break down. Relationships, systems, wealth, none of them lead to joy. Moments of happiness for sure, but not joy. Jesus, on the other hand, says, don't focus on all that worldly stuff, but put your treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. And we always thought, think that's kind of a curious thing to say. I mean, like, what kind of treasure do I have? What, 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 do I, what can I put in heaven that's more valuable than what, what I can put on earth? How does this all work? And Jesus is what he's trying to tell you is this. That this sense of joy comes not just from success, which comes and goes, but from the possibility of possessing that which you desire. 
from the prospect of gaining it. And if your prospect of gaining it is here on earth, then your hope and your joy is going to be based on here on the things of earth. But if your joy and your hope are in heaven, if you've placed your trust and your faith in Jesus, if you have given him your time, your talents, your treasure, if you have served him through the lives of other people and you've made all of those investments in the bank of heaven, then the closer you get to making that big final withdrawal, actually, the more joyful your life is going to become. The more filled with contentment, the more your sense of well-being grows because you know that your eternal destiny and your eternal life and the most valuable things you have aren't here on earth. But every day you're getting closer to possessing them. And our sense of well-being comes when we remember that God is there, that he is on his throne. And right now we don't have to stress out about all the things in the world. Should we be concerned? Yes. Should we be engaged? Absolutely. Should we be fearful? No. Because nothing going on in our world today diminishes God's power, his plan, or his purpose one iota. If you think anyone can foil the plans of God, you have a very high opinion of them. They can't. God is on his throne, and my sense of well-being is that his plan is working out masks or no masks, COVID or no COVID, economy or no economy. God's plan is moving forward, and my investment is in his plan, not mine and not the world's. And so my sense of well-being comes from remembering that my hope and my trust are in him and that my investment is in him, that the things that I'm doing, my treasure is in heaven. And the closer I come to it, the more joyful and the more peaceful my life becomes second thing is and this is very different i think we need to learn to ask a better question of ourselves when i have free time for a really long time i would ask myself the question what would be fun right i have a day where i don't have a whole bunch of things scheduled i don't have a bunch of meetings what would be fun And I would go out and I would do what was fun. I would go play golf. I would go ride a bike. I would go uh, run around here. I would just go read a book. I would, you know, whatever was fun. And I would, in that moment, be happy and excited to be doing it. But I found that consistently at the end of the day, I was discontent with that day. I was filled with anxiety and stress because there were these big projects floating out there, these things that weren't fun to do that needed to get done, and I was actually kind of stressed out that they weren't getting done, that the, the grass wasn't getting mowed, that the garage hadn't gotten cleaned again, that the, the writing project that I had hadn't moved forward. And I was so worried about that life should be fun. Life should be fun. I should be enjoying life, that I really wasn't enjoying life because I was pursuing fun and it was the wrong question. Because it was leading me to do stuff that I wanted to do instead of things that I needed to do. And when I changed my question from what would be fun to what satisfies, I had a completely different experience. What would satisfy me in this moment? And I realized that very often there was something really looming on me that that I was really kind of stressed out about and the fun question was causing me to, to have an excuse to push it off. But when I tackled it, even if I didn't finish it, if I moved it forward, I felt better. When I got the grass mowed when it needed to get mowed, even though it wasn't fun to do, I felt good that it was done. And at the end of the day, I found I still had moments of fun. When the grass was done, I could still go read a book. I still had time to go play golf. I could still go do other things. But if I had my life in the right order, if I was pushing the big projects forward, if I was getting done the things I knew that would make my wife happy or that would satisfy me, when I laid down on the pillow, I realized that I not only enjoyed that day, but I felt really good. I felt really good. I felt content because... I had moved forward the stuff that was important rather than giving myself an excuse to put it off. And so many of those projects were things that God was calling me to work on or God was calling me to do for someone else. And it was easy to put them off. 
But when I tackled them, I found out that my life was so much more satisfying that when I laid my head down on the pillow, I went to sleep well with peace because I knew the important stuff got moved forward and that there was still time for fun. In our culture, we tend to be worried about what do I want to do? What would be fun for me? What do I, what would be, you know, good for me? And delayed gratification is, is something that we're not really good at anymore. And I would encourage you to ask yourself, what is your question? What, what is the question that you ask yourself when you have some extra time, when you have some extra space? And is that actually bringing you joy? Are you ending the day joyful with a sense of well-being? Are you ending the day stressed out because you used it selfishly and it didn't actually make you happy in the moment like you thought and now at the end of the day, you're really unhappy? I think we need to learn to ask a better question of ourselves. As God's people, we need to be focused on his kingdom first, his things first, and pushing those forward. And those things don't always look like what we think. Moving God's kingdom forward isn't always opening my Bible or taking time out for prayer or engaging in worship. Sometimes pushing his kingdom forward is getting the garage clean because you know it will bring your wife joy to not see chaos in that space. To get the grass mowed because you know it will help your parents and when your dad gets home and realizes he doesn't have to mow the grass, that he's going to be relieved that he can actually take a breath after work and you're going to feel good about it. Moving God's kingdom forward is very often about serving other people, meeting their needs, and caring for them in ways that are meaningful to them. So ask yourself, what would satisfy today? And it might mean turning off the TV for a little while to go move something forward in God's kingdom that at the end of the day you'll feel better about than what you had planned to do yourself. So one, most importantly, stay connected to Jesus and build your treasure up in heaven. Two, ask yourself a better question. Three, is use your spiritual gifts properly. Each and every one of us have been given special gifts, abilities, talents, interests. They're things that you enjoy and you do well. Whether it's singing, cooking, organizing, evangelizing, preaching, everyone has things that they're good at. Those are gifts from God. He tells us that in our baptism, we were given special gifts. The problem is, sin, our sinfulness, like it does with everything else, turns our spiritual gifts around and makes them about me. And they become the way that I can manipulate other people because I can do this thing really well and they'll either owe me for having done it or they'll appreciate enough that I did it that I can ask them to do something for me. See how that works? And I use the things that I'm good at or the gifts that I have to my own advantage first. And at the end of the day, you feel selfish. The word that always comes to mind for me is a little dirty when you have used other people because you had a gift that they didn't and, and now they owe you or they had to do something in response or they even simply just gave you praise, right? If, if I'm up here preaching because what I really want to hear is how wonderful it was on the way out, then I'm doing it for the wrong reason. It's not about me. Your spiritual gifts were given to you to use for other people. The reality is your spiritual gifts are God's gift to the church through you. They're the ways that he wants to serve other people. That's the way he wants his light to shine through you into the lives of others. Whether it's singing or playing music, whether uh, you're a mechanic or a plumber or an electrician, whether you've got skills to be outside or just time and space, whether you're a person who can just cultivate money, you're really good at, at making money and, and giving it away, all of these things are gifts that God gives to be used for others. And when we use our spiritual gifts for other people, we discover the sense of well-being, the sense that this was good, that this felt good, that I was satisfied at the end of this day because of the way that I loved someone else in a way that I uniquely could. When you think of the different parts of your body, all of them function on behalf of the rest of the body. The hand is no good in and of itself. It can't support itself. It needs the rest of the body, and the body needs the hand. 
The eyes need everything else to move them around, right? God calls us, uh, Paul tells us that God views us as a body. And we are all here together because of our unique gifts that are intended to be used on behalf of the rest of the body. When we do that, we cultivate joy in our lives. We find satisfaction that God is using us and joy that he's changing other people's lives or touching them in important ways and that he is being seen through our service. That cultivates joy in our lives. When I use my gift for my own advantage, I don't get joy. I get discontent. I become unhappy and unsatisfied. When I use it for others, it's good. Three ways to cultivate joy. Stay connected to Jesus and invest in his kingdom. Ask yourself a better question. And third, use your spiritual gifts for other people. If you do those things, think about the end of the day that you'll have. If you have invested well in God's kingdom and been connected to Jesus in ways that are meaningful to you that day, if you have used your time on things that satisfy and that serve, and you've seen God shine through you in the gifts that he's given specially to you, that's going to be a really good day. And Jesus said that he came to give us joy and to give it to the full. That is to say that every day should be filled with that same sense of well-being. When you lay your head down on the pillow, you know that you saw God and he was seen in you. May God bless us to be a people filled with joy. Amen. Please rise as we go to the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. We thank God for the church and pray that God's people live confidently and joyfully sharing the message of salvation in word and deed. We pray especially for Rod's work here among us today, Lord, as he seeks to feed and serve families in Bethlehem and in the Holy Land with the gifts that he brings with him and with all missionaries, Lord. Gathered by your Holy Spirit, we pray that we be blessed with all grace and the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, be with us and bless us. We pray for our families. We ask the blessing of our bounteous God on all those who share in our kingdom, our Christian fellowship, and join with us in worship, and for all who are part of the household of faith. We also pray for those with special concerns and needs this day, those who are hospitalized and shut in, those who are grieved, the unemployed, the underemployed, the chronically ill, the shut in, and all those whose needs are known to us. We remember those seeking uh, healing and strength, remembering Karen, Danielle, Tyler, Colleen, Doug, Bill, Kathy, Heather, Marlene, Judy, Carol, those battling cancer, Darlene, Bill, Jerry, Ann, Steve, Roger, Lily, Matt, Annette, Mai, Doug, Kathy, Falana, Hank, Carmen, Lillian, Gretchen, Leonard, Jody, Jan, Shirley, Renee, Hannah, John, those we name before you in our hearts. We ask you, Lord, to bless them with healing and a sense of your nearer presence. On the eve of our, the day after 9-11, Lord, this weekend we have remembered um, the devastation that the human heart can bring. 
we ask you to bless our world with peace, to bless our leaders with wisdom, but most of all today, Lord, to bless the families of those who were most impacted by the first responders whose lives were lost or those in the towers. Heavenly Father, their families wake up every morning and still grieve that loss. We ask you to be with them, to draw them near to you, uh, and to give them the good news of the hope of the resurrection. We ask you to be with those who are in our military, Lord, who serve the cause of freedom and peace in a world that grows increasingly more dangerous. Be with Tim, Paul, Alex, Sean, Sam, Nate, David, Luke, Dan, Peter, Scott, Sean, Matt, Cody, Luke, Benjamin, Sarah, Matthew, Steve, Ben, uh, Danielle, Andy, Tom, and all of those in our armed forces, Lord. Keep them safe. Let them serve with honor and integrity and return them home uh, with stories of your goodness and mercy. Lord, grant that we bring your blessing to situations of need in all places. Most merciful God, we thank you for all those faithful people whose words and actions have guided us in the past, especially remembering those no longer with us on earth who now share in your eternal presence. By the working of your Holy Spirit, direct us to walk your servant way throughout our lives, seeing each person through your eyes until that day when we stand in your gracious presence in heaven. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Remind you here, there is an offering plate in the back for your gifts and offerings uh, to the Lord. Uh, if you are watching online, there are some options there on the screen that you can use to help advance the kingdom of God through the ministries of Emmanuel and the ministries we support. Now receive the blessing of the Lord our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our departing hymn. We'll rise for the final stanza of the hymn.
You may be seated. Uh, we are blessed again today to have the uh, olive wood carvers and uh, Rod with us this morning. So if you would like to come share with us. Good morning. I would like to thank Pastor Eric for having me here today with you. My name is Rod. I am a Christian from Bethlehem, and I represent all the Christians in Bethlehem and Jerusalem in a mission to help explain the situation in our area and to sell the beautiful olive wood articles of those remaining Christians in the Holy Land. The Christian population in the Holy Land has been dropping at an alarming rate. In the 1950s, we were more than 60% of the population. Today, we are less than 1.2%. This year and the past year have been very challenging for most of us and for the whole world. As for the Holy Land, it is no different. Tourism has shut down completely since the pandemic started back in March 2020, leaving the Christian families with absolutely no income as they depend heavily, as they have been for many generations on tourism to sell their olive wood handicrafts to pilgrims and tourists, and their income is no longer available. Also, our government was not able to provide any help or stimulus for the population. As a result, many of these Christian families have hit poverty level this year. If this hardship continues as it is now, we believe in few years, there will be no Christians in the Holy Land. Just imagine the land of our Lord does not have any living church. We are not here to ask for any donations. As many of you know, we come here once a year. We help provide much needed income for those families by selling their artwork, help them stay in the Holy Land, and protect our holy sites. Even the smallest purchase will make a difference in their life. Come and see what we have brought with us today. You might like something for yourself or as a spiritual gift for somebody who's in need, or maybe early Christmas shopping. Believe me, you have become part of our lives and our story. Your generosity has always helped and will continue helping those remaining Christians in the Holy Land. And for your convenience, we do accept cash, checks, and credit cards. Thank you so much, and may God keep you healthy and safe. Thank you. So he's just right in the narthex. If you would like to come and take a look um, to, uh, at what they brought, uh, beautiful things as always. Um, so take advantage of that. A voters meeting immediately following here in the fellowship hall. It should not be a long meeting. My wife always gets angry when I say that because that's like the cursing it. But uh, it should. We have to elect some officers. We need to approve um, some final budget things. Um, so if you can come down to the Fellowship Hall and join us for that. If you are online, if you can uh, check out the Zoom link that is, is uh, on the website or check your email. You, if you're a member, you've received that. Um, please join us for that. Do look through your news and notes. There's lots of information. We have a new director of uh, communications here. So you're going to notice that some of the communications look different. They have a little different feel. Um, we're trying out some new things, uh, and she's doing a great job. So uh, please share your feedback uh, on on the way that communications, the direction that they're moving as well. As we go, we remember our call to ministry, that we are going deeper in faith and sharing his love in community. meeting will be in the sanctuary so please stay in the sanctuary for the voters meeting 